In 1924, the pictorial photo album on Asia was published in Japan. From 1924 to 1932, it published over a thousand pictures about China, including its towns, villages, people, folk customs, various industries, and so on. The number of pictures documenting China's three northeastern provinces was the largest. Fiji的地域范围是非常非常广的 什么人能够拿着仗机这么全国自由自在游荡？他怎么会有那么大把的时间？谁来给提？而且照相仍然在那个时代是么昂贵的一件事情。所以你把所有的这些不解的东西都搁在一起，我觉得实际上一个答案
The next year, the pictorial photo album on Asia ceased publication. July 7, 1937 is considered today to mark the beginning of China's war of resistance against Japanese aggression. Frederick Wakeman, an American professor of Chinese history, points out that Shanghai was the first metropolis destroyed in World War II. Evidence for this is found in the documentary Shanghai, which was filmed by the Japanese themselves. The documentary was funded by the Japanese military and filmed by Japanese director Fumio Kami after the Battle of Shanghai on August 13, 1937. Kami managed to get Japanese military officers of various ranks to recall before the camera how Japan achieved victory in the battle. During the narration sequence, the director shifted his camera lens to acres of city debris, refugee-ridden streets, and war-torn land where rows of white wooden gravestones were erected near new tombs. The Japanese names on the epitaphs prove that the price Japan paid for its victory was far higher than that claimed in Japanese newspapers. When Japanese troops entered Shanghai, they were met by clearly reluctant Shanghai citizens, none of whom wore smiles on their faces. The purpose of these scenes in the documentary was to show the friendship of the Japanese soldiers towards the locals. But it's clear the children were obviously puzzled by their actions. As the anti-invasion sentiment of the locals evident in the film was entirely contrary to the original intention of the Japanese military, the director was imprisoned. Fumio Kami, a conscientious intellectual, later recalled that he filmed what he wished to film. In 1938, propaganda featuring Japan's victories in China was rampant. Kami wished to do something different by filming the real ups and downs of life. While Kami was filming Shanghai, a number of leftist Europeans were passing through various places before arriving in China. Among them were the well-known war photographer Robert Kappa and Dutch documentary director Joris Ivans. At that time, Shanghai and Nanjing had already fallen into the hands of the enemy, and Wuhan was now the center of the war of resistance. In Hong Kong, Kappa and Ivans met with Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chiang. Upon hearing the two foreigners wish to film a documentary about China's struggle, Madame Chiang was happy to work as an advisor. Uh, 这周恩来，我们那个很亲切的提着平头啊，在那谈笑风生啊，还有叶剑英啊，这些东西实际上都是卡牌拍的。Born in Budapest, Hungary in 1913, at middle school, Robert Kappa studied political science. He was a communist sympathizer, and as a result, was blacklisted by the authorities and eventually driven out of the country. He began to develop a liking for photography in Berlin and fell in love with Gerda Taro, a woman he would cherish for the rest of his life. In 1936, Kappa was sent by a media organization to help a colleague cover the Spanish Civil War, and it was while doing this that he met Ivans, American writer Ernest Hemingway, and Canadian surgeon Norman Bethune. He became friends with all of them. Kappa's greatest achievement on the Spanish battlefield was a photo that came to be known as the Falling Soldier that earned him an international reputation. But in 1937, during the Spanish Civil War, the woman he loved, Gerda Taro, fell beneath the tracks of a tank and died of her injuries just a day later. She was just 26 years old. 
Her coffin was sent to Paris on July 30th, 1937. Kappa bowed his head and followed her coffin sorrowfully. He felt terribly guilty as he thought he'd failed to fulfill his duty to protect her. From that day onward, the heartbroken Kappa focused his lens on the brutal battlefield. He believed that a camera per se cannot prevent a war. But pictures taken by a camera can reveal the war and hold it back. Kappa filmed the people of Wuhan struggling in their daily lives under the threat of Japanese air bombardment. He also took a picture of a train carpeted in a Nazi flag to prevent the Japanese Air Force from bombing the railway station. Another photo taken in Wuhan features the early spring of 1938 when there was a spring snowstorm. In it, people can see children cheerfully enjoying the sudden snowfall. In a time when Wuhan was still suffering from the ravages of war, this picture became one of Kappa's most joyful works. At a time when Kappa and Ivans were newcomers in Wuhan, they were ill-treated by their servants, despite Madame Chiang's orders that they be treated well. Ivans had to ask for assistance from his friends overseas to verify his importance as a director. Tamyuela 可是塔帕他们来了以后呢，就提出了要去看边看边，结果国民党政府都不让去。This response made Kappa feel discontented. Hemingway once teased that Kappa could speak seven languages, but had learned only one Chinese sentence. No photos. At that time, other Chinese cities were witnessing rapid change. After occupying Nanjing, the Japanese troops tried to invade Shuzhou from both the north and the south, and then they approached Wuhan. This picture was taken by Kappa in Chiang's command headquarters established in Hankou. Kappa and Ivans were given permission to attend a session of the military commission of the Guomintang Authority, sessions that were not open to the general media. Yes, it is true. We must endure the years of a hard war. That's why we must forget our old differences. Why should we fight one another? We must defend ourselves against aggression. We must unite. Then we can win. The flag of the Chinese Republic. One-fifth of mankind. An 
April 1938 in Tai Arjuan, Chinese troops were engaged in a desperate fight against tens of thousands of Japanese soldiers. Kappa, Ivans and their fellows were allowed to film at the front line in Shuzhou. On the train bound for Shuzhou, novelist Christopher Isherwood was a bundle of nerves and couldn't fall asleep. Kappa and the others, however, snored away calmly. Kappa later wrote about his approach to what he was doing. The war correspondent has his stake, his life in his hands, and he can put it on this horse or that horse, or he can put it in his back pocket at the very last time. I'm a gambler. I decided to go in with E Company in the first wave. This group of pictures was taken by Kappa during the Battle of Tai Ar Chuang. Kappa was known to say, if your pictures aren't good enough, you aren't close enough. But in the end, they failed to get the pictures they wanted. At 6 a.m. on April 7, 1937, Kappa woke up and found that the Chinese had occupied Tai Ar Chuang. He was angry because General Tu wouldn't allow him to get too close to the battlefield, and as a result, he missed recording Japan's first defeat in the era of visual documentation, and also missed scenes of China's first victory in this battle. When Kappa finally got there, he could only capture the last stages of the battle. An old lady in the debris shrieked when she saw the camera in Kappa's hands, thinking it to be some kind of cannon. Another old woman sitting beside a clod of earth and pieces of wood told Kappa that before the battle, this had been her home. Kappa documented them in the debris. In May 1938, just after the Battle of Tai Ar Chuang, this portrait of a Chinese soldier was published on the cover of the magazine Life. It was visual evidence of how tough-minded the Chinese were in their fight against the Japanese. At the same time, in the U.S., Ivan's film The 400 Million hit the screens. <laughs> Jiro 这个书我们不是一种投降式的逃跑式的书，是抵抗式的书。在抵抗的当中呢，我们损失，但是日本人也损失。但全世界当大家都认为你必败的情况下，中国人通过台湾告诉了全世界，日本人消灭不了中国，
Alex Kershaw gives an account of this in his book, Blood and Champagne, The Life and Times of Robert Kappa. Kappa apparently met Madame Chung several times. On one occasion, he later told a friend he had to pour several of her cocktails into potted plants to stay sober. The reason why Kappa had to keep himself sober-minded was that his professional sensitivity smelled the atmosphere of war. Later, Kappa became renowned for his coverage of the Normandy landing. By then, he'd already cheated death many times on the battlefield, but in 1954, while attempting to get close enough to the fighting in Vietnam, he stepped on a landmine and was killed. When he died, he was still holding his camera. Kappa had numerous love affairs. Film star Ingrid Bergman is said to have been one of his lovers. But when he died, the only photo he had on him was of his companion, Gerda Taro. We are proud of the Lincoln Battalion and the fight for Madrid that it made. 我觉得卡帕尔在中国的这些照片是非常珍贵的，还是装这部分。虽然他是事后去的，但是他仍然还是让我们依稀可以看到那场战争的惨烈的这种景象。再有一个呢，我觉得他拍了很多这个八路军办
In the early days of the war of resistance against Japanese aggression, Luce lobbied the U.S. administration to enter the war. It was his view that the U.S. needed to help China develop and be able to shoulder its responsibilities in international affairs and the upholding of justice. Luce was very supportive of China, also very supportive of China. He was very supportive of the Chinese government. So in the history of the Shilai Zhoukan, the Chinese government was very popular. He was a Christian child. 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 他们觉得，人的一个可能性，通过这个传教，通过说教，通过个人的努力，能够创造一定的这个美国。他支持蒋介石，因为蒋介石、宋美龄是教徒。Luce eulogized Chiang while voicing his disapproval of Mao Zedong, the head of the Communist Party and Chiang's opponent. An article clearly showed how he used his publications to support Chiang. Time magazine's bias was particularly evident in its news reporting on prominent figures. Time went to great lengths to present Chiang as a strong figure while describing Mao Zedong as a stooge of international communism. Under Henry Luce, Time hardly ever made mention of the political influence of the Communist Party. At that time, the Communist Party of China was also becoming aware of the importance of publicity. As early as 1936, Sun Qingling, the wife of Sun Yat-sen, received a letter from Mao Zedong and Zhou Onlai asking her to find a foreign journalist who would come and report on the communist-controlled area in Shanxi. Soon Ching Ling eventually settled on Edgar Snow, an American who'd been living in China for seven years. Snow, who'd worked for several newspapers, leaned to the left, and while teaching students in Beijing, he developed a genuine interest in the Communist Party of China. Edgar Snow, ah, 一九二八年就曾经来过中国。他来过中国以后，前后他就在中国生活了十三年。呃。并且在在中国结的婚，一九三六年呢，是他第一次到延安采访。斯诺是第一个被允许进入延安的西方新闻记者。In the summer of 1936, as Snow made his way to Yan'an, he started work on the book that would become famous as Red Star Over China. He also took a photo of Mao Zedong. After the picture was published by the U.S. newspaper Millard's Review in November 1936, it went on to become well known across the world. In the spring of 1937, Helen Snow, the wife of Edgar Snow, made her way to Yan'an. When she finally met Mao Zedong, she took out the now classic photo taken by her husband and remarked upon it. Helen Snow said when she escaped by leaping out of a window in Xi'an, she only had two things with her, the photo taken by her husband, which could also serve as a recommendation letter, and her lipstick, a vital accessory for any young woman. In Yan'an, Helen Snow met generals of the Chinese Red Army, whom she'd long admired. These are pictures of her in Yan'an. The 
the Snows were the first foreign journalists to become acquainted with the Chinese Red Army. Years later, the hat worn by Mao in this famous picture would be designated an historical relic. Nineteen thirty seven saw the beginning of the war of resistance against Japanese aggression, followed by a period of cooperation between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party of China. After Edgar Snow, the Kuomintang seldom allowed foreign journalists to visit Yan'an. The American journalist Harrison Foreman commented on this situation. Over the past five years, the Kuomintang authorities have forbidden any journalist to visit Yan'an. We submitted several applications requesting permission to visit the area controlled by the Communist Party, but all our applications were indirectly refused. Our journalists received such replies as, it's not convenient, the matter's uncertain. In the summer of 1944, however, this restriction was broken by a team of journalists. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the U.S. entered the war against Japan. The U.S. began to send war materials to all parties fighting against the Japanese, including those of the Chinese Communist Party. in July 1944, the U.S. sent a team This is a group photo of six of the foreign journalists in the team with Mao Zedong. Of the six foreign journalists, American journalist Harrison Foreman had a much earlier connection with the Chinese Communist Party. Foreman came to Yan'an in 1936. He took his group of photos of Chinese Red Army troops around that time. The uniforms seem quite different from the image many people have in their minds. China's Communist Army was able to deploy artillery, cavalry, and bicycle units. In the summer of 1944, Foreman entered the revolutionary base again. By that time, the Chinese Red Army had been renamed the Eighth Route Army. Foreman visited Yan'an and conducted interviews in the resistance base in northern China. While there, he wrote Report from Red China and shot a huge number of pictures. These pictures covered the whole spectrum of border life. Foreman had graduated from the University of Wisconsin, majoring in Oriental languages. During his trip to China in 1930, he visited Tibet in search of the Shangri-La described in James Hilton's popular novel, Lost Horizon. Later, Foreman toured the globe as an explorer, photographer, and war journalist. In 1940, he was appointed China correspondent by both the New York Times and the Times of London. Foreman has been called a modern Marco Polo and not without reason. During China's war of resistance against Japanese aggression, he focused his camera on many battle scenes in China. In Yan'an, he focused his lens on the legendary head of the Chinese Communist Party, Mao Zedong. This group of pictures of Mao Zedong was taken by Foreman. 
The legendary head is dignified, kindly, and somewhat shy. Joe on Lai always has a courteous smile in Foreman's pictures. Foreman took pictures of other generals such as Zhu De, Peng De Huai, Lin Biao, and Chen Yi. In July 1944, Foreman and these Chinese generals in Yan'an received the group of observers dispatched by the U.S. Army. In this picture taken by Foreman, Colonel Barrett and his colleagues received a warm welcome from the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. In this picture, Americans and Chinese are seen exchanging toasts. American scholar Carol J. Carter later gave an account of Yan'an people warmly entertaining U.S. privates with tiger bone liquor. Another sort of wine that the men in Yan'an tried was tiger bone. It was supposedly made by soaking real tiger bones in Pai Khan to give the drinker the strength, courage, and fierceness of the beast. This picture shows young people in the border region learning dance, a pastime that was popular in Yan'an at the time. Foreman described this in his report from Red China. On any evening, you might see bushy-haired shirt sleeve Mao Zedong having a grand time dancing a fast one-step with a cute co-ed from Yan'an, while a truck driver might be swinging buxom Madame Chu Te. Roly Poly Chu Te himself, commander in chief of over a half a million Jap killers, was having the time of his life dancing with a bright young thing one half his size and one third his age. After their visit to Yan'an, Foreman and a number of other foreign journalists went to the front line in northern China from where they were able to get a feel for the fighting as the Japanese were losing ground at the time and subjected to frequent attacks from both the army and civilians. These photos taken by Foreman are of 8th Route Army soldiers holding captured Japanese supplies. This one shows a Japanese prisoner of war. This poster boasts of the welcoming treatment given to Japanese prisoners at the workers and peasants school in Yan'an. On the front line in northern China, Foreman focused his camera on the determined local militias who also fought against the Japanese. The junior pioneers on parade, a local militia unit armed with homemade cannons and a grenade being placed to booby trap a doorway. Foreman described in his report from Red China. Moreover, over two million people's militia were organized to harass the Japanese and to cooperate with the Paluchun regulars and guerrilla forces in their hit and run operations. Foreman published his report from Red China when he returned to his homeland. 
At around the same time, the U.S. Army Observation Group sent its report back to the U.S., and it included positive comments on the Communist Party. Carol J. Carter gave an account of the Chinese Communist Party in his book, Mission to Yan'an, American Liaison with the Chinese Communist Party. In July 1945, General Ye gave a farewell luncheon for several of the men who were leaving the mission. After a few drinks of white lightning, Ye began criticizing the mission against Japanese fascism while continuing to support Chinese fascism. The reference to Chinese fascism was, of course, a reference to Chiang Kai-shek. After Japan surrendered in August 1945, peace did not last long between the Communist Party and the Kuomintang. After China came out of the Japanese war, the American media was divided as to the direction in which China was heading. Henry Luce issued a directive that would ensure his magazine published a portrait of Chiang Kai-shek on its cover. Theodore Harold White, a China correspondent, held very different opinions. If time showed unconditional support for Chiang Kai-shek, we'd be failing to fulfill our duty to millions of American readers. U.S. Representative Michael J. Mansfield wrote to President Truman. General Chiang Kai-shek doesn't trust the Communist Party and thinks he'll seek to replace the Kuomintang if left unchecked. Neither the U.S. nor the Soviet Union wanted to see China launch a civil war. During the Chongqing negotiations, Patrick Hurley the then U.S. ambassador to China acted as a go-between for the Kuomintang and the Communist Party. He went to Yan'an to meet Mao Zedong in person and then accompanied him from Yan'an to Chongqing. These photos of Hurley, Mao Zedong, and Chiang Kai-shek were taken by Jack Wilkes, a journalist with the U.S. magazine Life. On the surface, the figures in this picture seem relaxed, but in reality, the photos record the final separation of the two parties. These pictures taken by Foreman document a military mediation meeting between representatives from the U.S., the Kuomintang, and the Communist Party. The Communist Party representative is Ye Jianying. The Kuomintang representative is a general surnamed Tsai. The man in the middle is the American. In another picture, Ye is shaking hands with the U.S. representative, while General Tsai seems disheartened. These pictures record General Marshall's attempts to mediate in the conflict between the two parties in China at the time. Another American journalist recorded the dramatic moments when the American mediators withdrew from China.
This picture records how the wife of an American soldier went on a shopping spree before she departed. The stall owner is recommending a porcelain jar made during the reign of Qing Dynasty Emperor Kangxi. At the same time, in northern Shanxi, the last American soldiers were withdrawing from Yan'an. Shortly afterwards, Hu Zongnan's army under the Kuomintang began bombarding Yan'an. In 1949, French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson came to China and recorded a decisive moment during a time of regime change. Ten years later, he visited China again. French photographer Marc Reboud visited China more than 20 times. Why was he so fascinated by China? Please join us for part nine of Zoetro, China in the eyes of foreign photographers.